Good. Okay. Uh, well, welcome. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to uh, open the evening. This is our 25th um, annual Robert Salomon Morton Lecture. I'm uh, Professor Dov Waxman. I'm the chair of the Holocaust Awareness Committee here at Northeastern University. Uh, each year, we hold a Holocaust Awareness Week, the purpose of which is to remember the victims, to publicly remember the victims of the Holocaust, as well as a warning and to commemorate and th think about the lessons that the Holocaust carries through to the present day. And so we have a series of events uh, throughout Holocaust Awareness Week. Um, we've heard over the course of this week from a survivor. We have watched uh, a film. Uh, and this is the culmination of our week's events. And it's a great pleasure for me to, in, to be here to introduce to you our speaker this evening. Before I do so, I'd just like to make a few thanks and acknowledgements. I'd like to begin by thanking the fellow members of the Holocaust Awareness Committee at Northeastern University. Um, this has been a collective effort, um, and their involvement, engagement, support has been really invaluable and has made my job uh, much more pleasurable. So I want to begin by thanking them. I also want to thank the Humanities Center at Northeastern University uh, for supporting this event, the College of Social Sciences and Humanities, the School of Law, and the Provost's Office at Northeastern, all of whom have been essential in making this event possible. I want to particularly thank uh, the Morton and Gieson families uh, who are here with us this evening. Um, and uh, if, if they want to uh, just uh, put their hands up so we can acknowledge them. Thank you. Let me just, let me just tell you, uh, a let me just tell you a little bit about um, the life of Robert Salomon Morton, who is the, uh, for whom this lecture is named after. Uh, he was born in 1906 in Frankfurt, Germany, and he was personally a witness to and a target of Nazi persecution in the years leading up to World War II. And it was that experience, in particular in 1934, that convinced him that he had to leave Germany and come to the United States. And he finally came after a long process of trying to uh, get accepted as a refugee in the United States. In, uh, he arrived in Boston and um, spent the rest of his life with his wife Sophie as caretakers and caterers of the Hillel Foundation at Harvard University. And it was during that time at Hillel that he had a meeting, a chance meeting, in a barber shop, um, which uh, brought him into the life of Bill Giesen who was a professor at Northeastern University. Uh, Bill Giesen had grown up um, in Germany himself uh, during the Nazi period, and the two of them struck up a friendship, uh, perhaps an unlikely friendship. They had an ongoing conversation about their lives in Nazi Germany, and it was that friendship that um, is memorialized by this lecture as an inspiration. And so I want to thank in particular the Gustav Korman Giesen Memorial Fund and the Robert S. Morton Lecture Fund at Northeastern University for making this event possible. So thank you. Okay, it is now uh, my pleasure to introduce our speaker for this evening, Philippe Sands. Um, some of you had the benefit already of hearing from Professor Sands last night. You'll have the opportunity now to hear him again. He's a fantastic speaker, and we're really delighted to, uh, to have him here this evening. Philippe Sands is an international lawyer uh, and a professor of law and the director of the Centre on International Courts and Tribunals at University College London. He has a long and distinguished bio. I'll just give you some of the main highlights. Um, before coming to UCL, he's held positions at the University of London School of Oriental and African Studies, at King's College London, and at the University of Cambridge. And he's also been a global professor of law at New York University. Um, he's been invited to speak and has lectured and has held visiting professorships all around the world, including at the University of Toronto, the University of Melbourne, and at the University of Paris Sorbonne, so some fairly nice places to be. 
Um, he's also a practicing barrister, practicing uh, human rights lawyer. He's had ex extensive experience litigating cases before the International Court of Justice, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, the International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes, and the European Court of Justice. So not merely an academic, but a practicing lawyer. In fact, he was just telling me earlier that uh, in a couple of weeks, he will be taking up another case after talking about his latest book. He also frequently advises governments, international organizations, and NGOs on international law. And of course, he's here this evening as the author of East West Street, on the origins of genocide and crimes against humanity, published just last year. This book has received a huge amount of attention, acclaim, and awards, including the very distinguished Bailey Gifford Prize for nonfiction in the United Kingdom. So it's really a um, very prestigious award to have won, and a great honor for me to introduce to you this evening, Philippe Sands. Um, Sands. I'd just like to say, as, uh, as he comes up, uh, Philip will be signing copies of his books afterwards. We'll have a QA and a um, and he'll be happy to sign copies of his book outside after the lecture. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Rob, for that very generous uh, introduction. It's incredibly nice to be back uh, at Northeastern University. A little after three o'clock, on Friday, October the 1st, 1946, the last day of a trial that had lasted a full year in Nuremberg's Palace of Justice, Hans Frank stood in an elevator. A small wooden door slides open, he passes through, and he enters courtroom 600 of Nuremberg's Palace of Justice. Sitting in that room is Hirsch Lauterpacht. He's waiting for the door to open and for Frank to emerge. 700 kilometers to the west of Nuremberg, Raphael Lemkin lies on a bed in an American military hospital in Paris. He's being treated for hypertension, and he's waiting by a radio for news of the judgment. Three men, each in search of consolation, and each happens to be a lover of music. I've often wondered at that moment which piece they had in mind. Let's go back four years, to July the 31st, 1942, to Lemberg, the capital of District Galicia, in the heart of Europe. It's no longer Soviet Lviv or Polish Lvov. The city of Lyons has now been controlled by Germany for a year. At the main rail station, Hans Frank arrives by train to the sound of church bells and a military orchestra. He leaves the station in a large black automobile, passing through handsome streets decorated with the insignia of the Third Reich. In front of the Opera House, schoolchildren wave little flags in red, white, and black. Since October 1939, he has been Governor General of Occupied Poland, appointed by Adolf Hitler. It's a gift in return for services he has rendered to the Nazis since the late 1920s. He comes to Lemberg, now part of the government general, and spends a day at party functions. In the evening, he inaugurates a new theater, he calls it a sanctuary of art, for he is a man of culture. Years later, after the war, his friend Richard Strauss, the composer, will tell Klaus Mann, the writer, that Frank was a nice guy, a music lover, refined, terrific sense of humor. In 1943, Strauss composed a short piece of music in honor of this man. I managed to find the lyrics, which was not an easy thing, but it is said that the music has been lost, no doubt, to save further embarrassment. So we have to imagine the slender and swank Frank about whom Strauss composed. Frank says to his audience, we the Germans do not go to foreign lands with opium and similar measures to the English. We bring art and culture. To Lemberg, he's brought Beethoven and Fritz Weidlich, 
a little-known Austrian conductor. He wanted von Karajan, or better still, Futwängler, but neither was available. He has chosen for himself the music for the evening, Beethoven's Leonora Overture, followed by the Ninth Symphony. Following morning, Frank attends a ceremony to mark the first anniversary of the incorporation of District Galicia and Lemberg into the government general. The local newspaper, the Gazeta Lvovska, praises his elaborate speech in which he announces the reintroduction of European rules of social order into the city. And later that day, Frank holds a series of more private meetings. He wants to offer reassurance on Hitler's approach. Galicia and Lemberg, he says, they're the primeval source of the Jewish problem, but under German control, everything will be addressed. There's still some of them around, but we'll soon take care of that. He's a good courtroom lawyer, and he likes to pause, often for dramatic effect. I haven't seen any of that trash hanging around here today. What's going on? They tell me there were thousands and thousands and thousands of those flat-footed primitives in the city, but I haven't seen a single one. Those are the actual words entered into his official diary for the day. The audience applauds enthusiastically. Frank, of course, hasn't seen any Jews because they're in the ghetto 10 minutes away, 10,000 of them, 100,000 of them, 120,000 of them. In November 1941, his office has prepared a map with the title Umsiedlung der Juden, Resettlement of the Jews. And he knows that the ghetto is a direct consequence of those decrees, as is the death penalty, which will be imposed on anyone who sets foot outside the ghetto. A report records that his words are followed by lively applause. Within days of Frank leaving Lemberg, actually on August the 16th, 1942, if we want to be precise, Die Große Aktion begins, the great action to empty the ghetto and get rid of the Jews. A week later, Heinrich Himmler comes to town and the final solution is applied. Such events have consequences across great distances and over time. In August 1942, as the ghetto in the city of Lemberg is being emptied under Governor Frank's authorities, other ghettos are going through similar situations. This is footage from a It's not playing. It should be playing. I don't know why that is. I don't know whether Ignacio is around and he can help us, or otherwise you will have to imagine it. So you'll have to imagine it playing, I'm afraid. Um, I'm not sure why it hasn't. OK, okay here it goes. Great. This is actual footage from the ghetto in Krakow. It is unique and it is rare. It is the only known color footage from the ghetto. It's made on the personal orders of Hans Frank. And the footage today is in the possession of his son, Nicholas, who has allowed me to share it tonight. In fact, he has recently donated it to the Holocaust Museum in Washington. It's a private film, uh, and it shows street scenes and people milling around, barefoot children, white armbands. And eventually, in this very private film, we come to a young girl, a girl with a very beautiful smile, as you will see, who wears, remarkably, a red dress. And that smile has stayed with me ever since Nicholas first showed it to me. One of the families in the ghetto in Lemberg at that moment is that of a Cambridge academic, Hirsch Lauterpacht. His parents, brother and sister, and many other family members are confined there in Lemberg and Zhulkiev, a small town 25 kilometers to the north. During the First World War, Lauterpacht enrolls at Lemberg's law faculty when the city is on the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Three years later, in 1918, the war is over, and so is the empire. Over a bitter month, control of the city of Lemberg passes first from the Austrians, the Western Ukrainians, and then to the Poles. The city's name changes 
with each successive regime, and there is a great deal of bloodshed. Through a long winter, Lauterpacht will be on the front lines, protecting his family home and his parents. I managed to find a photograph of the actual street on which they lived, this image taken in 1918, and it ends, as you can see, with the barricade. In 1919, Lauterpacht moves to Vienna, and at the law faculty there, he picks up interesting new ideas about the rights of individuals. A seed is sown. He meets Rachel, a student of classical piano, and she records on the first date she played one of the early Beethoven sonatas. Very lovely, she will write in her diary, but not so easy to execute. Hirsch and Rachel marry in 1923. They move to London. He enrolls at the London School of Economics, and five years later, their only child is born, a son called Ellie. In 1937, Hirsch Lauterpacht is elected to a chair in international law at Cambridge University. The war begins in September 1939. Polish Lwów becomes Soviet Lviv. In June 1941, the Germans take control of the city from the Soviets, and once again, it is Lemberg. By then, Hirsch Lauterpacht is 45 years old. As Hans Frank visits Lemberg, Lauterpacht is deeply worried about his family. He hasn't heard from them for 18 months. His sister Deborah has one child, a girl called Inka, and she is born in Lemberg. Four summers ago, I met Inka in Paris. We drank black tea, and she told me about August 1942, and she spoke with a clear memory. She recalled that the first to be taken was her grandfather, Aaron, Lauterpacht's father. Two days later, Hirsch's sister, my mother, was taken by the Germans. It was on the street. My mother was rushed by Ukrainians and German soldiers. I watched from a window of our home on an upper floor. I was alone. My father was working nearby. Someone went and told him that my mother had been taken. I understood what had happened. I saw everything looking out of the window. I was 12. I was not a child anymore. I stopped being a child in 1939. I knew the dangers and all the rest. I saw my father running after my mother behind her on the street. And I understood that it was over. She speaks those words to me without any obvious emotion, and it's clear that she spent a lifetime dealing with that single moment, watching from a window. I was watching discreetly. I wasn't brave. If I'd been brave, I would have run after her. I knew what was happening. I can still visualize the scene, my mother's dress, her high heels. My father didn't think about me. You know what? I rather like that. For him, it was simply about the fact that they had taken his wife, the woman he loved so much. It was just, for him, about bringing her back. And her father went off to look for his love in his dark gray suit. And then he was taken, and Inca was alone. She manages to survive on the streets for a few weeks. She hides in attics, and she is sheltered by some neighbors. And one day, she knocks on the door of a Roman Catholic convent and is taken in and hidden until the war's end. She tells me that the only condition that was imposed is that she must agree to be baptized. Lauterpacht knows nothing about any of this. He's far away, an academic in Cambridge. In fact, on the very day that his father is taken, unbeknownst to him, he actually starts work with the British and American governments on the war effort, offering legal advice. He's come to know Robert Jackson, President Roosevelt's Attorney General, and later a justice at the Supreme Court. They work together as Lauterpacht imagines the role of the law in the protection of individuals. In the summer of 1945, after the war in Europe ends, Lauterpacht publishes a new book. It has the title, An International Bill of the Rights of Man. You are looking at the first ever book 
written by an international lawyer on the subject of human rights. And it includes the idea on the protection of the individual against the actions of states. States should no longer be able to kill and torture and do other atrocities and then hide behind a so-called principle of sovereignty. This is, in 1945, an absolutely novel and revolutionary idea. And he prepares the first ever lawyer's version of a draft International Bill of Rights. At the end of the war, Churchill, Roosevelt, and Stalin announce that there will be a war crimes trial held in the city of Nuremberg, and Robert Jackson will be the chief prosecutor. The British hire Lauterpacht to join the prosecution team. In July 45, Jackson travels to the UK to draft the Charter of Nuremberg. The US, the British, the French, the Soviets disagree about the crimes which the tribunal will prosecute. And it is to Lauterpacht that Jackson turns for help on this thorny problem. On July the 29th, Jackson is driven to Cambridge, England, from his hotel in London. And he lunches with Lauterpacht and Rachel. They sit together in the Lauterpacht garden of the house on Cranmer Road. This is Lauterpacht in that garden. Someone will record that the grass is freshly cut, that it offers a sweet, fresh smell, and notes that there's a child that keeps wandering in and out. Over tea, no doubt with a favorite Victoria sponge, uh, Victoria sponge cake from the local bakery, Fitzbillies, the two men discuss the list of crimes. Lauterpacht offers a suggestion. Why not insert headings into the statute to help public understanding? Jackson is very positive about the idea. At this point, Lauterpacht offers a second. Why not refer to these matters as crimes against humanity? Here you can see the words written out in Lauterpacht's own hand. The term on Lauterpacht's view will cover torture and murder and other persecutions, and it will seek to protect the individual. And it introduces a totally new concept into the law. Jackson likes the idea and takes it with him back to London. Within just a few days, crimes against humanity is adopted in the Nuremberg Charter. It is the first time it has ever been used in a legal instrument. Lauterpacht will tell the British Foreign Office that it's an innovation, an enlightened concept which affirms the protection of all individuals and that those who break the law cannot shield themselves behind a concept of sovereignty. Now, as all of this is going on, 4,000 miles away in the city of Durham, North Carolina, a little closer to here, another former resident of Lemberg is also thinking about exactly the same matters, but in a very different way. He was born 300 miles to the north of the city on a farm near Azariska, which is now in Belarus. Raphael Lemkin is his name, and he also happened to study at the very same law school as Lauterpacht, the University of Lvov Law Faculty. But he arrived in 1921, two years after Lauterpacht left. In 1926, he obtains a doctorate in criminal law. The great love of Lemkin's life is probably his mother, Bella, and he will often record that she used to sing him simple Russian poetic melodies. From this world, Lemkin moves to Warsaw to work as a public prosecutor. At a League of Nations meeting in 1933, he proposes for the first time a new international crime, one that will combat barbarism and vandalism against groups of people. For Lemkin's focus, unlike that of Lauterpacht, who is concerned with individuals, is on large numbers of people bonded by racial, religious, or national identity. Nothing comes of the idea. It's 1933. Hitler has just come to power. But the idea concept will become Lemkin's cause and his obsession. Six years later, as the Third Reich invades Poland, Lemkin is in Warsaw. He escapes to his parents' town of Wolkowisk, then under Soviet control, and eventually to Stockholm in Sweden. The following year, in 1941, 
he is given academic refuge at Duke University in North Carolina. The journey from Stockholm to the United States is long. He actually has to travel three quarters of the way around the world. He has no money and almost no personal belongings, but he travels with a vast quantity of luggage, for he has spent the year in Stockholm collecting decrees promulgated by Frank and other Nazis in occupied Europe. His luggage is filled with thousands and thousands of pages of paper, literally all of the decrees he can find, and he carts these across the world. These he will analyze when he's ensconced at the Duke University Law School, and he obtains a book contract. His work examines whether there is, under these decrees, a master plan which dominates and motivates the actions of the German rulers. The book is published in 1944, and it is called Axis Rule. Chapter 9 of the book uses a new term, which you can see in Lemkin's own hand. This is the first time the word has ever appeared, and he has invented it. It stands for the destruction of groups. In 1945, Lemkin is hired by the US War Department to assist in the prosecution of war crimes. He works with Robert Jackson's team, but separately from Lauterpacht. Lemkin is greatly disappointed to learn that the Nuremberg Charter will include crimes against humanity, the protection of individuals, but not genocide, the protection of groups. He flies to London to press for the inclusion of genocide at the next stage of the proceedings in the indictment. There is strong opposition from Jackson's office under pressure in particular from southern US senators who worry that claims of genocide might be invoked by African Americans. And of course, the British too worry deeply because of their colonial legacy that the term will be used in relation to their actions. Many of Lemkin's colleagues think he's just too pushy, but amazingly, the word makes it into the indictment. And this is the first time it appears in any legal text, and it comes with Lemkin's own definition, the extermination of racial, religious groups. And it explicitly mentions Jews, Poles, Gypsies, and others. And it covers all occupied territories, including Lemberg and Volkovis. On October the 18th, 1945, the indictment is filed at the tribunal. I went to London and I succeeded in having inscribed the charge of genocide against the Nazi war criminals in Nuremberg. Lemkin will later write. Pause for a moment, for there is here a striking coincidence. The two men responsible for introducing these two new terms, crimes against humanity and genocide, into international law, studied at the same university, walked the same streets, entered the same buildings, had even the same teachers. Yet somehow they developed very different ideas on how the law might protect against atrocity. Remarkably, the origins of both these international new crimes may be traced to the city of Lemberg, to events at the end of the First World War, and to the law faculty of the university. Indeed, you can trace, as I have done, the origins to a single teacher that the two men had in common, Professor Julius Makarevich, a Polish professor of criminal law. You can even go one step further and trace the origins to a single room where Makarevich taught, still a classroom today. A quarter of a century after studying with Makarevich, the two men are now deeply involved in the Nuremberg trial. Lauter Pact is with the British, arguing for the protection of groups, and Lemkin is with the Americans. Sorry, Lauter Pact is with the British, arguing for the protection of individuals, and Lemkin is with the Americans, arguing for the protection of groups. They're together, but they're also apart. And one other thing that they share is a total absence of information as to the fate of their own families. The trial opens on November the 20th. Amongst the 21 men in the dock is Hans Frank, with whom our story began. He was caught in May 
near his home in Bavaria, a little south of Munich, along with 42 volumes of his diaries and a fantastic collection of artworks. And when I say fantastic, I mean fantastic. Amongst the paintings is one of the most famous in the world, Leonardo da Vinci's portrait of Cecilia Gallerani, the lady with an ermine, painted in 1489. It hung in Frank's private rooms at the Varvel Castle in Krakow, and he took it with him when he left to return to Germany in January 1945. Frank's son, Nicholas, tells me that as a young boy, his father made him stand before the painting and part his hair, just like Cecilia Gallerani. Now Frank is charged with crimes against humanity and genocide. It's a long way from the good old days, hanging out with A.H. and Richard Strauss. Frank is in the dock. He sits near Hermann Goering, dark glasses often concealing his expression. Lord Justice Lawrence, the English judge who presides over the trial, will discuss that moment of opening as simply unique in the history of the world. It's never happened before. Lemkin is confined to Washington because his colleagues now find him uncontrollable, obsessively pushing his genocide agenda. He's just not a team player, constantly talking to the press. Lauterpack is in court that day, a member of the British delegation, but he is strongly opposed to Lemkin's ideas and to the word genocide, which he considers to be impracticable and totally unsupported by precedent. And Lauterpack worries that the focus on groups will distract from the more important task of protecting individuals. On the opening day of the trial, the prosecutors describe the crimes against humanity and acts of genocide. They focus on the atrocities in the city of Lemberg in the days following Frank's visit. More than 133,000 people tortured and shot in that period, including 8,000 children killed in just two months. Imagine Lauterpack sitting in that courtroom, listening to that being said, and not knowing whether those victims include his own family. On this day, Lauterpack and Frank are in the same room, and I'd very much like to see a photograph of them together. But Lauterpack's son, Ellie, tells me that none exists. I don't quite believe that that can be possible, and so I spend day the archives of Getty Images in West London, the home of the largest collection of photographs from the opening days of the trial. I spend a full day going through literally hundreds of old glass plate images. And after several hours, I eventually find what it is that I'm looking for. You will see Lauterpacht in the top left-hand corner at the end of the British table. He sits with elbows on the table, hands clenched under his chin. He looks attentive. He's immediately behind a Soviet prosecutor who stands at the lectern. If you now move to the lower right-hand corner, you'll see the oversized famous figure of Hermann Goering in the classical light-colored suit. Six along to the left is the semi-bowed head of Hans Frank. I find this image rather moving. Lauterpacht and Frank divided by just a few tables and chairs. Lauterpacht, at this point the photograph is taken, knows nothing about the fate of his family. He will have studied Frank attentively, but if Frank saw Lauterpacht, he will not have known of the personal connection between them. Six months into the trial, on the 18th of April 1946, Frank has a chance to set out his defense. The tribunal has just heard evidence from a lone survivor of the killings at Treblinka on Frank's territory. Samuel Reisman is the name of the witness, and he explains that he was present on the platform on the 23rd of September 1942 for the arrival and dispatch of Sigmund Freud's three elderly sisters. I visited Treblinka with my son a few years ago, and I was curious to see what remained, not much. We had lunch later at a small restaurant in the nearby town of Brock, placid and hushed and a world away 
from the killing fields described in court by Reisman. The restaurant was a simple place. And as we entered, we both noticed that a radio was playing a most unlikely tune in Poland. Familiar words floated around the room, and the song immediately caught my ear. There's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. Frank is questioned about his role in Poland after 1939. I bear the responsibility, he says. This is somewhat unexpected. Do you feel guilty? That's a question for the tribunal. Five months into the trial, however, he says he's been able to gain a full insight into the atrocities. I am possessed by a deep sense of guilt. That feels almost like an admission. But on the stand, Frank seems nervous. He's observed looking around for signs of approval from other defendants, but it's never quite forthcoming. Did you loot art treasures, he's asked. Well, I saw to it that those art treasures remained in the country right to the very end. What about the art in your possession when you were captured? I was safeguarding that art, not for myself. You can't steal a Mona Lisa. He's referring to Cecilia Gallerani, and the argument is, of course, hopeless. The defendants are all seen at this point to be grinning, but Hermann Goering is deadpan. Did you introduce Jewish ghettos? Yeah. Did you introduce badges to mark the Jews? Yeah. Did you yourself introduce forced labor in the government general? Yeah. Did you know the conditions of Treblinka, Auschwitz, and Majdanek? Auschwitz was not in the area of the government general. I was never in Majdanek, nor in Treblinka, nor in Auschwitz. Of course, the attentive reader will note straight away that he doesn't answer the question he's actually been asked. He knows, as a decent lawyer, it's a dangerous question, and he sidesteps it. Did you ever participate in the annihilation of Jews? I say yes. And the reason why I say yes is because my conscience does not allow me to throw responsibility solely on minor people. I want to be clear. I myself have never installed an extermination camp for Jews or promoted the existence of such camps. But, he continues, he recognizes his own most horrible utterances. My own diary bears witness against me. It's no more than my duty to answer your question in this connection with yes. And then he says this, a big moment in the trial. A thousand years will pass, and still this guilt of Germany will not have been erased. This guilt of Germany. A great silence descends over the courtroom, for Frank has accepted a collective guilt, the guilt of the group, but not his own individual guilt. Goering is seen to be shaking his head in disgust. Later, over lunch, Frank talks with Captain Gustav Gilbert, the US Army psychologist, tending to his needs. Frank hopes that the judges were impressed by his obvious sincerity. But just a few weeks later, when he returns to the stand in August, he retracts the tentative, limited expression of collective guilt for the other defendants who've just got to him. Von Ribbentrop, former foreign minister of the Reich, tells Captain Gilbert that no German should ever say that his country is disgraced for a thousand years. And Admiral Dönitz, in the dock, Hitler's successor, complains that Frank should only have spoken as an individual for himself, not for Germans as a group. In June 1946, Lauterpacht finally learns of the fate of his family. The news comes from Inka, his niece, who is in a displaced persons camp in Austria. She has tracked him down after hearing of newspaper reports that her uncle is involved in the famous trial. She sends an acquaintance to Nuremberg who will stand outside the Palace of Justice for three weeks, whispering, Hirsch Lauterpacht, Hirsch Lauterpacht, every time someone comes or goes. And eventually, a person recognizes the name. This leads to a letter and to contact. And Inka will tell her uncle that she is the only member of the family to have survived. Later that year, Inka comes to live with Hirsch and Rachel in Cambridge. The prosecuting powers make their closing arguments at the end of July. 
This is an intensely difficult period for Lauterpeid, a time of personal grief, but also serious professional challenge. For he has the task of preparing the closing legal arguments for the British. He writes frequently to his son, Ellie, and in one letter, he describes the moving strains of Johann Sebastian Bach's Matthew Passion. From this, Lauterpacht draws solace and strength. The Matthew Passion must have had a particular resonance for Lauterpacht. This is a work that reflects Bach's desire to emphasize a pietist belief in the value of the individual. Every aria but one in the Matthew Passion is sung as ich, I. The three landmark choruses are sung in the first person plural. That is an intention to downplay the role of the priest celebrant and the church, to limit the role of the group and to emphasize the vital importance of the individual, the individual's direct connection with God. Lauterpacht understood that connection. today in Montreal, in Pecunias, but completely surrounded by books, and with a very fine memory, tells me the story of what happened over those days. And one detail in particular haunts him as he recalls his uncle's visit to the hospital in Munich, where Saul was recovering from a minor operation. You know, the Germans in the clinic were incredibly nice to me, very polite. My uncle didn't look at them. He hated them like they were poison. As the trial draws to an end, the prosecution offers closing arguments. They address crimes against humanity in some detail, but genocide remains in the frame somewhat surprisingly. The Soviets, the French, and amazingly now the British, all support a conviction for the crime of genocide. But Robert Jackson and the American team is opposed. He closes for the Americans and says nothing about genocide. British support for genocide is somewhat unexpected. Lauterpacht has strongly opposed its use, and he makes no mention of it at all in the draft he prepares for Hartley Shawcross, the Attorney General who will deliver the closing British arguments. Lauterpacht's son, Ellie, has a copy of the handwritten original of that manuscript. He shows it to me. It argues for the protection of every individual human being and for the rights of man against the barbarity of his own state. But notably, it makes no mention of Hitler or of the Nazis. For Lauterpacht is implacably opposed to the reduction of matters to a struggle between groups. Ellie tells me that his father never once talked about the fate of the family, that he was an intensely private man, and he was not prone to public displays of emotion. And that makes, for me, all the more striking one feature of Lauterpacht's draft. Over dozens and dozens of pages, the only defendant to be mentioned more than once is Hans Frank, the defendant most directly connected to the murder of his own family. Right at the end of the 76-page handwritten manuscript, Lauterpacht permits himself to become personal, to target the man who sat but a few feet from him in the dock. 
This handwritten version reflects a rare passion and anger. He writes of the accused, neither have they seriously attempted to alleviate the anger of the civilized world by a simple admission of guilt. Even the abject confessions, with a ring of sincerity about them, on, have been no more than artful evasions. It, he is, of course, referring to Frank, to the tentative expression of collective responsibility offered in April, retracted in August. In his handwriting, he then continues, witness defendant Frank confessing to a sense of deepest guilt because of the terrible words which he has uttered, as if it were his words that mattered and not the terrible deeds that accompanied them. What might have become a redeeming claim to a vestige of humanity reveals itself as a crafty device of desperate men. He, like other defendants, have pleaded to the very end full ignorance of that vast, organized, and most intricate ramification of the foulest crimes that ever sullied the record of a nation. On the legal arguments, Shawcross uses most of Lauterpacht's text, but he does make two significant changes. He adds British support for genocide, and he removes all the references to Hans Frank. By now, Lemkin too has learned of Frank's role in the destruction of his entire family. In a New York archive, actually at Columbia University, I find an undated page of pencil writing in Lemkin's hand in the limited archive that remains. It's a single sheet of lined yellow legal paper. If you look at it carefully, you will see that he has written the word genocide at least 25 times and then crossed them out. He's also toyed around with other formulations. If you look very carefully, right in the middle of the page, hidden amongst the thicket of words, you will see another which is crossed out. It took a long time for me to spot it. It comes with a line pointing away that resembles an arrow. And the word is frank. Judgment is given over two days. On September the 30th and October the 1st, 1946, Frank will be the seventh to learn of his fate. Has he done enough to save himself? Hoping for mercy, interestingly, he too thinks often about music, and he frequently evokes the work of a single composer, Johann Sebastian Bach. This we learn from the diary of Captain Gilbert, the American army psychologist who has been tending to him. It must be, Erbarme dich, Erbarme dich, mein Gott, have mercy, have mercy, my God. How extraordinary, two men on opposite sides of the courtroom finding solace in the same musical space. As the judgment is read out, Frank sits motionless. The American judge, Francis Biddle, summarizes Frank's role from the day he joined the Nazi party in 1927 to the end in early 45 in Krakow. Frank destroyed Poland, crushed opposition with a reign of terror. The concentration camp system was introduced on his territory. Notorious camps like Treblinka, where Lemkin's parents perished, although Lemkin would never actually know about this. Frank oversaw the liquidation of the Polish intelligentsia and thousands of Poles. He deported slave laborers to Germany, persecuted Jews by forcing them into ghettos, starving them, and then systematically and brutally exterminating them. Biddle takes note of Frank's expression of terrible guilt for the atrocities committed on his territory, and notes, too, that not all the criminal policies originated with him. But if Frank's hopes rise, they are soon crushed. Biddle concludes that Frank was a willing and knowing participant in terror, exploitation, starvation, the deportation of Poles, and a program involving the murder of at least three million Jews. Frank is found guilty of war crimes and crimes against humanity, but the judgment against him, as with all the other defendants, makes no mention of genocide. The tribunal adjourns for lunch, and the judgment is totally silent on that word. It has simply disappeared. 
The tribunal reconvenes at 10 to 3. The defendants this time are not in the dock. On this occasion, uniquely, each will await his turn outside the courtroom. Each will enter alone to hear the sentence and then be escorted out. For many observers in the courtroom, the enduring memory of the entire trial is this single hour and the small sliding door at the back of the dock through which each defendant will enter to face the judges. Open, shut, open, shut, open, shut. The door slides noiselessly. So writes R. W. Cooper of the Times of London, formerly the newspaper's lawn tennis correspondent. Frank comes in at number seven, up the elevator, through the sliding door, into the courtroom, and then he loses all sense of direction and stands with his back to the judges. The guards have to spin him around. The writer, Rebecca West, who is in the press gallery and who happens to be having a tempestuous affair with Judge Biddle, notices this and remarks upon it in her writing of the trial. Odd proof, she will write, of Frank's complete perturbation. Frank listens to Lord Justice Lawrence, who speaks in translation just four words. Tote durch den Strahl, death by hanging. Frank will never know that the French judge, his old acquaintance Henri Donnedieu de Vab, who came at his invitation to speak at a conference in Berlin in the summer of 1935, ironically enough, on the idea of creating an international criminal court, voted for life imprisonment, but he was overruled by the other judges. Biddle will note that the French judge was curiously tender towards Frank. Frank leaves through the sliding door, open, shut, open, shut. When Captain Gilbert comes to his cell, Frank smiles politely, but this time he's unable to look at the military psychologist in the face. Death by hanging, Frank says softly. He nods his head and says, I deserved it and I expected it. Two weeks later, on October the 16th, R.W. Cooper of the Times is in Paris. There he will receive news of the hanging. He learns of the end in a little Paris restaurant as musicians strum a popular new song written by Jean Sablon. It has the title Insensiblement. A photograph of Frank's hanged body is sprawled across the back pages of the newspaper. Ça, c'est beau à voir, a patron murmurs, idly turning the pages. A beautiful thing to see. Frank was the sixth to be hanged in the courtyard of Nuremberg's Palace of Justice, and Lauterpacht is satisfied with the judgment, believing that it will contribute to the protection of individuals. Lemkin, on the other hand, is distraught. The judgment does not refer to the word genocide, not even once. And he will describe that day as the blackest of his life, worse even than the day he learned about the deaths of his parents and family. So what came next? Modern human rights and international criminal law came alive. The debate between the focus on the individual and the group never was resolved. So both ideas were embraced. A month after the judgment, the United Nations General Assembly affirmed that the Nuremberg Charter, the judgment and crimes against humanity were part of international law. And the tribunal then went further than the tribunal and affirmed that genocide is a crime under international law. In December 48, States adopted the Convention for the Prevention and Punishment of Genocide, the first modern human rights treaty, largely driven by the efforts of Lemkin. They also agreed a Universal Declaration on Human Rights, a non-binding instrument that drew inspiration directly from the Outer Pax book. In 1950, the European Convention on Human Rights was signed, setting out for the first time ever a legally binding list of minimum rights for all individuals and setting up a European court to hold governments to account. Now, in fact, in Lemkin's legacies have been far-reaching. 
remarkable, despite their common origins, their common locations, often their common teachers, it seems that the two men never actually met. Crimes against humanity and genocide, for their part, now live side by side. The ideas of the two men are the stuff of my daily working life. Although more than 50 years would pass before the ideas of these two men were truly taken forward, the catalytic moment was the events, the crimes in former Yugoslavia and Rwanda. In July 98, more than 150 states adopted the Statute for an International Criminal Court, 60 years after Donny de Vabre and Frank talked about it at a Berlin Congress. The court, of course, is able to rule both on genocide and crimes against humanity. Two months later, the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda convicted Jean-Paul Akayesu for the persecution and slaughter of Tutsis by Hutus for genocide. Akayesu thus became the first human being ever to be convicted for the crime of genocide by an international court. In November 98, the House of Lords in London ruled that Augusto Pinochet, former president of Chile, was not entitled to claim immunity before the English courts because the acts in which he was alleged to have engaged torture of his political adversaries were a crime against humanity. This was the first ever such national ruling. In May 99, Serbian President Slobodan Milosevic became the first ever serving head of state to be indicted for crimes against humanity. In October 2000, genocide charges were added in respect of the atrocities in Bosnia at Trebrinica. In March 2007, an American judge stripped a man called John Calimon of his American nationality. Why? Because in August 1942, he had been a Ukrainian auxiliary policeman in Lemberg involved in the rounding up of Jews in Die Große Aktion, and that was a crime against humanity. In September 2007, the International Court of Justice in The Hague ruled that Serbia had violated the obligation to prevent genocide at Srebrenica. This was the first time ever that a state was condemned for violating the Genocide Convention. In July 2010, President Omar al-Bashir of Sudan became the first serving head of state to be indicted for genocide at the International Criminal Court. And in April 2012, Charles Taylor was the first head of state to be convicted for crimes against humanity. The cases go on, so do the crimes. What, one might ask then, is the enduring legacy of these two legal terms? Lao Tzu Pact believed passionately that we should be concentrating on the protection of individuals. And he would argue, I'm sure even today, that Lemkin's invention of the concept of genocide was dangerous, that it was practically useless, and that it would simply replace the tyranny of states with the tyranny of groups. In a way, my own practical experience in international courts concords with that view. I've observed for myself that by focusing on the protection of one group against another, there's a tendency to reinforce matters of identity, to reinforce the sense of them and us, to amplify the power of group identity and association, which is, of course, a source both of sustenance and of danger. How does this happen? In seeking to prove that a genocide has occurred, you have to establish the existence and expression of an intent to destroy a group in whole or in part. That has to be proved. And I've seen for myself how the process of establishing the evidence and trying to prove that tends to reinforce both a sense of victimhood of the targeted group as a group and hatred towards the perpetrators as a group. But of course, I also understand what Lemkin was trying to do, and he was surely right to recognize the reality that in most, indeed if not all cases, mass atrocity is targeted against human beings, not because of their inherent individual qualities, but because they happen to be a member of a hated group. And Lemkin would say, and it's a powerful argument, that the law must reflect that reality, that it must also recognize and give legitimacy to feelings that each of us in this room will no doubt have of association with one or more groups. This profoundly strong sentiment 
was brought home to me recently. I wrote an article for the Financial Times magazine, a profile of an interesting, remarkable German doctor, Dr. Jan Kisselhahn, a psychologist who has established the program to assist Yazidi women and girls who have been enslaved, tortured, and systematically raped by individuals associated with Daesh, ISIS. Jan Kisselhahn is the person who helped create the program to bring 1,100 of these remarkable people to Germany for medical and psychological treatment. I should mention that not one has been given a right to come to the United States or the United Kingdom. He identifies, does Kisselhahn, a connection between the possibility of justice and the future well-being of these victims. Characterizing such atrocities as genocide, he says, is a vital first step. He welcomed the use of the word genocide by the European Parliament, by the Obama administration, and eventually, even in the face of strong opposition by the British government, by the Westminster Parliament. Calling it a genocide, Dr. Kisselhahn told me, recognizes the group's identity, what is being done to it, and its right to exist as a group. In this way, for him, the implication is that crimes against humanity is just not enough. Nevertheless, I remain concerned about the hierarchy that seems to have emerged, one that puts the concept of genocide atop the list of horrors, so that a mere crime against humanity or war crime is seen somehow as a lesser evil. Call something a genocide, and it will be on page one of our newspapers. Call it a crime against humanity, and if it makes it into the papers at all, it'll be on page 13. That is the power of the word invented by Raphael Lemkin. That is the power of our own association with the protection of groups. These issues, of course, are at the fore again today. There is, as we know, a poison of xenophobia and nationalism and populism coursing its way around the veins of Europe and other parts of the rest of the world, including, most regrettably, the United States. I see this on my journeys to central and eastern parts of the European continent, to Hungary, to Poland, to the Ukraine. Those of you who've seen my film, My Nazi Legacy, will have observed me standing in a faraway field, watching somewhat bemused as hundreds of people dressed in SS uniforms celebrate the creation of the Waffen-SS Galizzi Division back in 1943. I see this in the United Kingdom with the Brexit vote, not for everyone, but for some, and in related political developments. One former London mayor, Ken Livingstone, offensively evokes Adolf Hitler as a supporter of Zionism. Another former London mayor, Boris Johnson, now astonishingly my country's foreign secretary, suggests that the European Union and Adolf Hitler somehow share common aims. Mr. Johnson has no compunction in referring to the President of the United States publicly, as he then was, as part Kenyan, to explain Mr. Obama's perceived anti-British tendencies. And of course, we see it here in the United States, right today in the newspapers following the election of Mr. Trump. The overt use of racial and identity politics is now center stage. The themes that I've evoked are, for example, central to Mark Leela's much discussed and rather provocative piece in the recent New York Times newspaper with the headline, The End of Identity Liberalism. It's impossible for me to go through the experience of writing East West Street, a sort of total immersion in the world of the years between 1914 and 1945, and not feel a truly acute sense of anxiety as to what is stirring. Those who have read the book will know that I oscillate between the views of Lauterpacht and Lemkin, between the individual and the group, between the realism of Lemkin and the idealism of Lauterpacht. I can see the force of both arguments. And I can recognize the tension and the struggle between the individual and the group, between crimes against humanity and genocide, one that will not soon be resolved. International law today embraces both concepts. After I first told this story, which was back in 2010, when I gave a lecture at the law faculty in the city of Lviv, as it is now called, a young woman approached me. She was a law student. Why, she asked, 
do you take such a personal interest in these matters, which are also so much a part of your working life? Lemberg happens to be where my grandfather was born, I explained to her. Back in 1904, I had come to Lviv to see the streets he walked as a young boy when Lauterpacht and Lemkin were there and to see if I could find his house. Many decades would pass before another and much more direct connection would crystallize between my family and the Lauterpachts. Hirsch's son, Ellie, was my teacher, my first teacher of international law in the early 1980s. But three decades would pass before Ellie and I would learn that his father, Hirsch, and my great-grandmother, Amalia, my grandfather's mother, happened to be born in the same small town of Zhulkiev, just north of Lemberg. Remarkably, they even lived on the very same street, Lembergerstrasse, which is just in houses that were just a few hundred meters apart. That street was known by the remarkable writer Joseph Roth as East West Street. And East West Street was the first street on which my great-grandmother Amalia walked. A long time would pass in the research that I did before I discovered that my grandmother traveled on that same transport that I had made mention of from Theresienstadt to Treblinka with the three elderly sisters of Sigmund Freud. She, too, was observed by Samuel Reisman on the 23rd of September, 1942, for she perished at Treblinka. She would not have known that a couple of weeks later, Lemkin's parents followed her to Treblinka, the last street on which Amalia walked, the last street on which Bella and Joseph Lemkin walked, was Himmelfahrtstrasse, the street to heaven, the street from the railway platform to the gas chamber. Lauterpacht and Lemkin, individuals and groups, Zolkiev and Treblinka, I've learned that personal stories really matter and that individuals can make a difference. I've come to know, as you will have picked up, Hans Frank's son, Nicholas. When we first met, he removed a photograph from his jacket pocket and he passed it to me. It was the lifeless body of his father after the execution. It is to remind me that my father is well and truly dead, Nicholas will say. A couple of years after we had come to know each other, Nicholas and I would go to Krakow to visit the Vavel Castle. We spend a few minutes alone with Cecilia Gallerani. This is the first time in 70 years since the summer of 1944 that Nicholas has been with the painting. I'm allowed to take a single photograph to capture the moment when he saw that painting again. evening, Nicholas and I will dine together at a restaurant in Krakow's old town. He'll ask me about my book, and I'll ask him about his. At the end of our meal, three people come up to our table. The older of them is a distinguished lady, and she says to us, we couldn't help overhear your conversation. Your book sounds really interesting. We invite them to join us. They drink tea and coffee with us. Turns out she's a mother with her daughter and her son-in-law. She's an academic, a professor of chemistry. She's a serene, distinguished lady who now lives in Brazil. But she's come back to the city where she was born, Krakow, forced out in 1939 because she was a 10-year-old Jewish child. How much, I wondered, of my conversation with Nicholas had she actually overheard? Did she realize who Nicholas was? The daughter was born well after the war in Brazil, and she took a very strong line 
against Germans, far stronger than her mother. She said to us, you know, I enjoy being in Krakow, but I can never forget what the Germans have done. Actually, I don't ever want to talk to a German. Nicholas and I glance towards each other, and then the mother looks at Nicholas and asks, and you, are you a Jew from Israel? <laughs> Nicholas answers immediately, quite the opposite, madam. I'm a German. Actually, I am the son of Hans Frank, the Governor General of Poland. There was a fleeting moment of deep silence. Nicholas stood up and left the restaurant. Later, I would find him at the entrance to our hotel. And he said to me, you know, they were right to have such strong feelings. I truly feel a shame for the wrong that the Germans have done to them, to the mother, to their family. And I comfort him. Individuals and groups, it seems, is never an easy thing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I think I can, I think I can speak for everybody um, to, I'm quite lost for words. This was wonderful, powerful, deeply moving. Thank you very much. Um, we have some time for questions. So if you'd like to, if you have any questions, if you'd like to raise your hand, I can pass around the microphone, yes. Hello, I'm a student here at Northeastern of history, but I've developed an interest in international law. And I noticed that one of the shifts that we're seeing is a lot of the atrocities, a lot of the crimes against humanity are not being committed by states, but by non-state actors, groups such as ISIS. Where do these words, these crimes against humanity, fit with these evolving situations? They, they cover them. Um, I mean, I was in New York on September the 11th, 2001, and so witnessed a crime against humanity which was not committed by one state against another, but by one group of human beings against another group of human beings. Um, and the law is actually pretty flexible. So the classical, traditional international law concern with states has withered away, and um, it, you know it's possible even, I think some people would, describe some of the killings that have happened in this country. I'm thinking of the killings in Orlando and Florida targeting a particular group at such a level could be said to be a crime against humanity. Uh, some people will even say it's a genocidal uh, act, and that turns, of course, on definitions. But I think we don't need to worry. If any individual, uh, if any of you is minded to commit a crime against humanity or genocide, you don't need to do it in the name of a state to find yourself potentially hauled up before an international or national court. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Hi, I'm just curious how um, your research and how the documentary making as well has impacted your litigation career. Well, less time. Um, <laughs> I mean, over the last five or six years, I've put quite a lot of time into this, and so I've had to cut back uh, on litigating cases as counsel, because that is all-consuming. And it's when you're, as anyone in this room knows, that when you are litigating a case, you can't do anything else at the same time. It completely takes over. What I have done then, and it's a sort of personal strategic decision, is I sit much more as arbitrator or judge on cases in a whole range of different disputes, um, investment disputes, uh, sport disputes, which somehow have come my way uh, for reasons I can't fully understand, but which I hugely enjoy. So I've done, I, I've done much less, but I haven't stopped. And I probably do a couple of big hearings of up to a month uh, each year. I think one of the things that I've thought about a lot is the interaction between being an academic, being a litigator, and writing a book like this. And I think they're interconnected. I mean, I think I draw a sense of nourishment from the academic work that I do, and it means that I've got to make sure that everything is footnoted and sourced and supported, and I think I wouldn't be quite so keen to do that if I didn't have the academic background. I think the litigation background has been vital. 
because one of the things that we are taught to do as litigators, well, we're taught to do a number of things. One is to be completely dispassionate. And I think one of the things that's touched a lot of people in the book, it's gone, it's had a resonance that has completely surprised me and certainly the publishers in the UK and the US, and it's been bought now, I think, in 14 languages around the world, is that it's a very dispassionate tone. I don't wear my heart on my sleeve. And a lot of people have asked, how can you possibly have gone through this and not felt an intense sense of emotion? And of course, rather like Lauter Pact, I, I do feel an intense sense of emotion, but I don't feel the need or the propriety of, of exposing that on the page. But the other thing is that as a litigator, you are really trained in the finding and the presentation of facts. And I realized that those teachers that I had three decades ago who taught me how to present facts in a courtroom, how to marshal the muck of evidence, taught me a lot. And a lot of the stuff in this book I think I would never have found if I had not been equipped. You know, you know that someone is in a courtroom on a particular day. You know that there are photographers in the courtroom. You know that this will have been the most photographed opening day of any trial in human history. The idea that there is no photograph of Lauterpacht and Frank in which they are both in the same image strikes me as improbable, and I'm going to find that photograph, and I know where to look, and I know who to call up, and I know how to open doors to get that, and I'm going to find it. If it exists, I am going to find it. There is no photograph, I think, of Lemkin in the courtroom, which seems to me extraordinary. But there is a reason for that. He was very much a backroom player in the case, not a full and proper member of the American delegation. They found him irritating. They kept him out of the picture. He was disheveled. He rambled. He was obsessed with these issues. And they kept him out. And I think what he did would sneak into the back of the courtroom and hang out at the back. So I've got a number of pictures where you've got sort of indistinct people in the back who could or could not be Lemkin. I'm really keen to find a photograph <laughs> of Lemkin, but I have not been able to find one. And then we'll continue. We'll come over here, and then I think there's a gentleman over here. So, so I, I have a question about terminology. So the phrase genocide in groups, I get that. But crimes against humanity, which you describe as against individuals, doesn't, those two things don't fit so well to me because humanity seems to me to be not individuals, but everyone, right? So, so and, in and in fact, not only is it everybody, but it's an appeal to solidarity. We're all in this together. And someone who commits a crime against humanity has violated really a universal norm rather than a crime against an individual. So I'm wondering how the phrase crime against humanity got translated into a phrase that really now, as I'm sure you're right, has actually become historically identified with crimes against individuals. OK, so the first, I'm very, very careful in my use of words and what I say came first and second and how it happened. So the term crimes against humanity had actually, or crimes against mankind, or crimes against Christianity had emerged in 1915 in relation to the Armenian massacre. And the American ambassador, Morgenthau, actually uses the term in a dispatch, originating, we think, from a Russian. Although I received a letter last week from the librarian of the William Ewart Gladstone Library in Chester, England, directing me to Prime Minister Gladstone's use of a similar term in the 1880s. But it was not used in a legal concept. It was a description of what had happened. And I think what Lauterpacht did, well, what Lauterpacht did was he's, you know, beaver way. He works on this book actually funded by the American Jewish Committee in 1941. He gets, a, as I write about it in the book, he's, he's retained to prepare a draft International Bill of Rights and prepare uh, a book. And his focus is on the protection of individuals. And what happens is in the summer of 45, when Jackson comes to visit him, is he basically takes the work that he's been doing on individuals, which he is focused on, and looks for a formulation to put into the heading, into the statute. And he chooses crimes against humanity. Why does he do that? What he is effectively saying is that the killing 
of even a single individual in an act of solidarity affects all of us. And the crime of killing an individual is a crime against all individuals who collectively amount to humanity. But in his writings, he wouldn't use the term genocide. He did not want groups to be reified in the law because he worried, as I explained, that the focus on groups would trump, as I think it has in international criminal justice, the protection of individuals. So you're right in one sense that the term crimes against humanity or crime against humanity doesn't, in the same way as genocide, immediately um, conjure that same focus on a particular individual. But it's when you marry the work that he's doing at that point and look at the phrase that he has taken, and in fact the way it's evolved subsequently, is um, an act of killing of a large number of individuals in the Bataclan in Paris, for example, or in the Twin Towers in New York could not be described in international law or even in general terms as a genocidal act because the individuals who are targeted and victims do not share a group identity of the kind that the law recognizes. So that's how one explains uh, that difference. There was a gentleman here, I know you were putting your hand up and I'd, I'd spot We have you, time for one last question, so yes, please. Thank you, I'm very happy to be the last. <laughs> um, to be honest, I'm a layman. Uh, maybe I will make some ignorant, biased remarks. And um, actually, when I, was, uh, when I was in the south of Italy, it was the first time that I got to know that there were so many, um, not so many, maybe several minorities, minority groups, who also suffered from Holocaust. But it seems that um, most of the attention is paid to Jewish people during the Holocaust. So why there are not so, um, there's not uh, so much attention paid to Sindhi people or Dominanti people? Because um, it was actually a Roma people, a Roma person yeah. who told me uh, how to say Holocaust in uh, Roma language. Yeah. So I, I was really shocked and why? And uh, my second uh, question is, it just came to me right now. So uh, because I'm, I'm from China and China was also one of the suffering countries during the World War II and we lost a lot of people and we, there were a lot of massacres as well. So um, the difference, uh, if I make a difference in a personal way, I would say in, in Europe there is, there is a, really a very human human recognition. In China, when we talk about this kind of trauma, it's more in a very collective way. So it's a, on a national level. So in this way, in so doing sometimes, we will just ignore the personal suffering. We will just equate a trauma with a national suffering. But when we refer to an individual suffering, it will become maybe a stigma of the mm. person. Mm. So in the end, it's really not fair. I mean, when we talk about the issue of the um, military prostitution, uh, I mean, the, yeah, it's always a very um, heated issue in Asia, in, among Japanese government, Chinese government, and also Korean government. And this is why we, we never <laughs> reach an agreement. And uh, but in, when I was in Frankfurt or in Paris, I noticed that it's really very individual and almost uh, in every sensible um, place, uh, lieu de mémoire, you, you, you always see a lot of labels, indications about this person from this year to this year, he lived there and, uh, and this year was deported. So, um, well, I mean, just, just, I mean, you've asked, you've raised two really important issues. Um, so if you look at Lemkin's work, okay, and you go down to the archives in New York which hold his stuff, you will find literally thousands of those little old-fashioned cards that people used to record information. And Lemkin was focused on acts of genocide across the centuries. 
So when Lemkin focused on what happened in the period 1933 to 1945, he did not focus on Jews. I mean, he dealt with the Jews, but it was not, and he was very careful to do this, exclusively about the Jews. And he was always very careful to focus on other groups who had been targeted uh, also. And of course, it's a complex and sensitive matter as to how ownership of horror is allocated into, in the international uh, community. And it is certainly true that in popular Western consciousness, a particular emphasis has been placed on the treatment of the Jews in that period. That, of course, is in part the, the, the sheer numbers who are involved compared to the other groups. But I think the point you make is a very, very important one. I want to illustrate it and the complexity of this issue in a different way. In, in the UK, we have a body called the Holocaust Day Memorial Trust. And the Holocaust Day Memorial Trust was created at the initiative of the government to commemorate, to memorialize what had happened against the Jews in the period 1933 to 1945. But it was also given the task to memorialize other acts of mass atrocity. And of course, the question becomes, on what basis do you choose which acts of mass atrocity do you focus on? So I was asked to serve on the Academic Advisory Committee. And at the first meeting, I sort of innocently asked, well, how on earth do you choose which, which ones you're going to focus on? Because it's a very complex uh, issue. And they said, well, we've actually we've got a formula. The Foreign Office has got this formula for us. And it has to have happened after 1945. And an international criminal tribunal must have called it a genocide. Crime against humanity, war crime isn't enough. So I said, well, that's just absurd. So you're telling me that on that basis, you will commemorate or mark, memorialize the killing of 8,000 Bosnian men at Srebrenica as a genocide, but you will pass in silence over the killing of 3 million Congolese between 1998 and 2003. I did that case, so I'm acutely aware of it. And they said, yes. And I said, but what is the social utility of such an approach, which basically says some people are given an elevated status and others just are ignored completely? It makes no sense. And they said, I know we agree, but we've got to, we've got to have a formula to deal with these issues. So your question raises some very, very powerful concerns. And I'll just briefly mentioned just, just by way of conclusion, I mean, how a community marks and recognizes what has happened. You focused on the, the memory stones in Frankfurt and other German cities that mark, if you like, every single act of deportation and killing that is identified. To focus on the individual as an honorable thing, as a way of saying what happened to that individual really matters as an individual. That person was mistreated, and that person has inherent qualities as an individual, which we as a community value. But other communities, as you say, deal with it in different ways and are very uncomfortable with the emphasis on the individual and would prefer to focus on a group trauma, a national trauma, an ethnic trauma, or some such thing. And I think that reflects the complexity of how we identify with these kinds of issues. I mean, each person in this room will think differently about the question. If I am to be protected by the law from these kinds of acts, do I wish to be protected by reason of my inherent qualities as a human being, or do I wish to be protected because I happen to be a member of a group that is entitled to protection. And that question forces us actually to ask the question, who, who am I? Which is what we often ask ourselves. How do I define myself? Of course, it's not binary. It's not one or the other. It's shades of complexity. But at the heart of the debate between Lauterpacht and Lemkin, I think it's a very, very profound issue about who we are as human beings and how we self-identify, and how we wish others to identify ourselves. And right now, in my country, in the United Kingdom, and in the United States, those are burning, burning, burning political issues. Because we see 
that particular individuals who happen to be members of a particular group feel a sense of marginalization, which causes them to come together as a group and do certain things as a group, often against other groups. So I think this issue has come back with a vengeance, uh, coincident with the publication of this book. That is, I hope, just a coincidence. I'm sure I have not <laughs> contributed in some indirect way to Brexit or the election of Donald Trump. <laughs> but I think, I I think what Lauterpacht and Lemkin were up to goes to a much deeper philosophical, cultural, psychoanalytical, psychiatric, anthropologic. I mean, there's just so many ways. I've had sort of over, well over 2,000 emails since the book came out. And you just get people from all different communities, all around the world, all different um, activities that they're in saying how the individual group relationship comes up. So it doesn't surprise me at all that you've made the comments as you've had. I'm particularly pleased, I have to say, that the book is being published in Chinese. Uh, it's been bought by a Chinese publisher, uh, although interestingly not by a Japanese publisher yet, which I think this raises very complex questions, uh, as does the uh, about responsibility, as does the film My Nazi Legacy. Thank you very much. Thank you.